Okay, good afternoon. First, I would like to thank you for your presence at the last uh, CVSP Common Lecture, especially the graduating students. Thank you. Uh, I promise it's going to be short, 40 minutes only. Tayyip Saleh was born in 1929 in al shamalia province in the Sudan. He died in London in 2009. He's an Arabic language novelist and short story writer. Saleh attended universities in Khartoum and in London. He worked in radio broadcasting as head of drama for BBC Arabic service. The novel, Season of Migration to the North, Mausim al Hijra ila al Shamal, referred to as Mausim, was published in 1966, translated into English in 1969. It is a prose poem that deals with the conflicts of modern Africa, such as traditionalism versus modernism, rural versus urban men versus women, and the village, the specific, versus the universal. He also wrote Ars Zain, The Wedding of Zain, and other stories in 1969. I will start by quoting some parts of the lecture that Tayyip Saleh gave at AUB way before you were born, in 1980. He starts by saying, I have never before addressed such an enormous crowd. I don't really know whether a writer can say anything about his work, above and beyond what he has already said. I started season in the summer of 1960, when on a holiday in a little village near Cannes. I got stuck. I got stuck before Mustafa Saeed started his confession. I fell under the influence of Freud, what you read at the beginning of the semester, and read more than once civilization and its discontents. But above everything else, the foundation of my work for what it is worth lies in what I am, a Sudanese Muslim Arab who was born at a certain time in a certain place. I believe that if I have contributed anything to modern Arabic literature, it is my constant plea for toleration. One of the major themes of season is the East-West confrontation, or to be more specific, the confrontation between the Arab Muslim world and the Western European one. He says, I created, therefore, a conflicting world in which nothing is certain, and formalistically, two voices to force the reader to make up his, her mind. We have already discussed the East-West, self-other, Occident-Orient relationship, or if you wish to call it confrontation, in Edward Said's Orientalism. Said describes the positional superiority of the West where Europe was always in a position of strength, not to say of domination. According to Edward Said, Orientalism promoted the difference between the West, the self, and the Orient, the other, and deepened the distinction, always reiterating Western superiority over Oriental backwardness, expressing the strength of the West and the weakness of the Orient. We will encounter the same view of polarization, tension, and division between the East and the West, the South and the North, specifically in the novel between the Sudan and Imperial England. The two voices in season, already mentioned before, are those of the narrator, Rawi, and Mustafa Said, 
Critics and readers have different views on the representative figure and main voice in the novel. Who is the protagonist? Is it the anonymous narrator or is it Mustafa Said? I leave it up to you to decide in class discussion. Both stand for two Sudanese who lived and studied in England, but their relationship with the West, with the North, is quite dissimilar. The narrator considers the coming of the British was neither a tragedy nor yet a blessing. Mustafa Said has a relationship of defiance with the West. He poisons his life trying to avenge the defeat of the Sudanese, the colonization of the East, engages in sexual relationships with English women and kills one of them. Three commit suicide, possibly because of him. First one is Sheila Greenwood, a waitress in a restaurant. The second is Isab uh, Isabella Seymour, wife of a successful surgeon and mother of two daughters and a son. The third one is Anne Hammond, a, wait a university student. Jane Morris is the woman he falls in love with marries and kills with a sharp blade on a cold February evening. Now I will discuss the colonial context of the novel. The novel cannot be understood outside the historical, colonial, and post-colonial Arab discourse. It was in September 1898 that the forces of imperialism, the British army, led by Herbert Kitchener, invaded the Sudan. Muhammad Ahmad, a religious leader who challenged the power of British occupation of Egypt and was able to end Egyptian rule in the Sudan in the 1880s. After his death, the Khalifa carried on the state, which um, was ended by British occupation in 1898. The reforming and foreign governments felt the fear of such religious movements and attempted to oppose them or control them. It was at Omdurman, on the banks of the Nile, that witnessed the east-west-south-north confrontation. The battle was between the Sudanese desert tribesmen, who rumbled around 52,000, against the military might of the biggest empire and Kitchener's men who were just 20,000. The Sudanese had swords and spears, and the British had guns and rifles. The battle was over in five hours, and Kitchener remarked arrogantly that the enemy had been given a good dusting. In the novel, Kitchener says to Mahmoud Wad Ahmad, after his defeat at the Battle of Atbara. Why have you come to my land, to my country, to lay waste and plunder? It was the intruder who said this to the person whose land it was. And the owner of the land bowed his head and said nothing. Mustafa Said resumes the Battle of Omdurman. More than three decades later, with the same spears, and swords, the victims being the British woman rather than the British army. He says, I resumed the war with bow and sword and spear and arrows. The city was transformed into an extraordinary woman and with her symbols and her mysterious calls towards whom I drove my camels. Now, the post-colonial Arab discourse, I will discuss the impact of the West during the Nahda period. The contact between the Arab world and the Western one signal was during the Nahda, and it signaled the beginning of the debate between traditionalism and modernism. The term Nahda literally means awakening or renaissance. It covers the period from the mid or late 19th century to the present. 
During this period, the impact of the West became a major factor in the Arab social and political life. Europe as a self recognized itself as different from the non-modern, the other. With the expanding power of Europe, the question to be answered was the following. How could Arab Muslims acquire the strength to confront Europe and become part of the modern world? The Arab awakening can be seen as a struggle between two standpoints. The first adhered to Islam as the source of legitimacy. The second took the West as a model to aspire to. <clears throat> Many regarded modernity as uniquely and strictly a European phenomenon. The most prominent representatives of the Islamic modernist or reformers, like Rafa'a al Tahtawi, Jamal al Din al Afghani, and Muhammad Abdu, were opposed to Western domination but appreciated the Western scientific and cultural achievements. They realized that living in the modern world requires certain changes which could be carried out while Muslims remain true to themselves and the purity of early Islam. In conclusion, the religious reformers aimed at the following. Try to reconcile tradition and modernity, hoping that the Muslim world can overcome the challenges it was facing. They stressed the need to return to the original sources of Islam. As for Taha Hussein, a famous novelist and prominent literary figure, he took the second position. The West should be taken as a model to imitate. He asserted that we must follow the path of the Europeans as to be their equals and partners in civilization, in its good and evil, in sweetness and bitterness what can be loved or hated, what can be praised or blamed. Now I will examine the first voice in the novel, that of Arrawi, the narrator. He was the other in England, and after returning to his village, he feels the other in the Sudan. The first page of season announces Lauda, the return of the narrator to his people after an absence of seven years in England, where he received a doctorate degree in English literature. He rejoices leaving the coldness of England and returning to the warmth of his people in the small village at the bend of the Nile. He returns with great yearning, Hanin, and he feels a sense of stability. I felt not like a storm swept feather, Risha fi Mahabirrih, but like that palm tree, a being with a background, with roots, with a purpose. These feelings are reassured every time he visits his grandfather, Hajj Ahmad. He reveals a desire to seek roots in the village and to re engage himself in his society and culture. The grandfather stands for the traditional immutable man who has the secret of life, and it is to live simply and die simply, a simple and traditional life that both the narrator and Mustafa Saeed were not able to lead. Contrary to Mustafa, the narrator considers the North is very much like the South. He says, over there is like here, neither better nor worse. But I am from here. Just as the date palm standing in the courtyard of our house has grown in our house and not in anyone else's. The fact that they came to our land, I know not why. Does that mean that we should poison our present and our future? Sooner or later, they will leave our country. The railways, ships, hospitals, factories, and schools will be ours. <coughs> uh, 
After spending some time in his village, the narrator goes to Khartoum to teach pre-Islamic Arabic poetry at a secondary school. He feels that life is good for him and the world remains the same. Yet the narrator has not remained the same. Contrary to his affirmation that I too had lived with them, i.e. the British, but I had lived with them superficially, neither loving nor hating them. According to the narrator, imperialism and the coming of the British was neither a tragedy nor yet a blessing. This view differs radically from that of Mustafa, as we shall see later. He idealizes his country and his people only to realize that things have changed and the world has turned upside down. No sooner does he find that the love he wants to flow from his heart has turned into rage and anger. Mustafa Saeed disappears one day by drowning or more possibly by suicide. We don't know. And he leaves his wife, Husna, and his two boys in the care of the narrator. The narrator falls in love with Husna bint Mahmoud, yet he does nothing. He does not let love flow from his heart, as he claims at the beginning of season, where he says, I want to give lavishly, I want love to flow from my heart, to ripen and bear fruit. Now I will discuss the reasons for the alienation, the internal migration, not the geographic one, of the narrator. There are two reasons for the narrator's alienation. One is patriarchy and tragedy. The second is the corruption of the new rulers of Africa. Patriarchy, you are familiar with the word from the Beauvoir's feminism. Wad Reyes, a 70-year-old man, much married and much divorced, wants to marry Husna, who is very decisive when she says that she will go to no man and threatens to kill him and kill herself if they force her to marry him. In that small, small village at the bend of the Nile, we see the same duality between the self and the other that Simone de Beauvoir refers to in the second sex. A woman is simply what man decrees. She is the incidental, the inessential, as opposed to the essential. He is the subject, he is the absolute, she is the other. Wadrayus argues that men are guardians of women and that she will marry him whether she likes it or not. He says that God said in his noble book that women and children are the adornment of life. Is it true? Al Nisa wal Banun Zinatul Hayat. Only to be corrected by the narrator who recites the verse as it appears in the Quran, it is Al Mal wal Banun. Wealth and children are the adornment of life. Her father forces her to marry him, and few days later, after the marriage, she kills him and kills herself. Mabruka, Wadreyis' first wife, and the narrator are the only two people in the village who do not curse Husna. However, their reasons for that are quite different. The narrator confesses that Husna bint Mahmoud was the only woman he had loved. Hajj Ahmad prays to God to rest the soul of Wad Reyes, curses all women whom he considers as ikhwat al-shaytan, sisters of the devil. Now the second reason is the corruption of the new rulers of Africa. The alienation of the narrator multiplies. He attends a conference at the Ministry of Education to discuss ways of unifying the educational methods, Tawheed al-Manahij. The conference is held in the Independence Hall. Notice the name of the hall, Independence. In a hotel in Khartoum. The hall was designed in London, the white marble imported from Italy. 
The minstrels are dressed in silk, mohair, and cashmere. The cost of the whole, one million pounds, and the wealth of the minstrels stand in sharp contrast to the poverty of the Sudanese, who lack schools, who lack hospitals. The minister in his speech considers the bourgeoisie as being more dangerous to the future of Africa than imperialism. It is the same minister who leads a very bourgeois life. He is known to be corrupt and has amassed a fortune from the sweat of the poor, wretched, half-naked people in the jungle. The narrator starts considering going back to the north. He says, there is no room for me here. Why don't I pack up and go? The migration that appears in the title of the book involves not only geographic migration to the north, but also the internal migration, l'ghurbi, of the narrator, who starts feeling the coldness rather than warmth of his own people. Twice in the novel does the narrator say, there is no justice or moderation in the world. The first time he says his statement, after attending the conference in Khartoum. The second time, when he describes the courtroom scene in England, where Isabella Seymour's husband stands to defend his wife in spite of the fact that she confessed to him her relationship with Mustafa Said. He says he feels no bitterness towards her and expresses his deep sorrow at losing her. The narrator feels bitterness and hatred. The unfaithful wife is defended by her husband, while the faithful Husna suffers a tragic end in that small village at the, pit, at the bend of the Nile. He says, I feel bitterness and hatred, for after all these victims, he crowned his life with yet another one, Husna bint Mahmoud, the only woman I have ever loved. Now I will discuss the second voice in the novel. Many consider him as the protagonist, that of Mustafa Said. We can notice the dissimilarity with the narrator from the first few pages of the novel, and clearly after he starts his confession on page 19. It is specifically on page 19 that the author, Tayyip Saleh got stuck and read more than once what you read in the semester, Freud's civilization and its discontents, especially his theory of man as divided between Eros and Thanatos. Mustafa Said was born in Khartoum in 1898. Notice the date. It's the same year of the Battle of Omdurman. He decides to avenge the colonization of the Sudan, but under his own terms. He conceives his relationship with the English woman as a battle, inflicting pain and suffering on them and treating his victims as Kitchener treated his native people, the colonized Sudanese. As a child, he was raised by his mother his father died before he was born. He lives with her like strangers, and they act as relatives to each other. He is described as isolated, arrogant. His mind is like a sharp knife, and his heart is as cold as a piece of ice. Nothing in the world could shake him. He pursues his education in three places, Sudan, Cairo, and London attends a British school in Cairo, leaves to London where he receives a doctorate degree in economics from the University of London. The mysterious call led me to the coast of Dover, to London and tragedy. He lives in England for 30 years, but is, is insensitive to its beauty and he enjoys nothing. Mustafa is concerned only with his campaign of inflicting pain and suffering upon the English woman. He uses terms of Arab military campaigns 
every time he goes out to find a new victim. He says, by day, I lived with the theories of Keynes and Tony, and at night, I resumed the war with bow and sword and spears and arrows. I saw the troops returning, filled with terrors. He saddles his camels, refers to the Arab army conquering Spain in the eighth century, and claims that one of his forefathers was a soldier in Tariq ibn Ziyad's army. The connection in Mustafa Said's mind between sexual conquest and his military war on colonialism is very evident. The description of his sexual conquest are similar to the description of a military conquest. He says, yes, my dear sirs, I came as an invader into your very homes, a drop of the poison which you have injected into the veins of history. If we examine Mustafa's character outside the historical and colonial context, his role would be reduced to a seducer and a womanizer uh, who's concerned with sexual fantasy and filling his bed with a different woman every night. His bedroom becomes a battlefield, a theater of war. Now I will discuss the three levels in Mustafa Said's uh, character. The first level you're very familiar with is the Freudian level. Mustafa Said represents on one level a man divided between Eros and Thanatos. The death instinct is both directed inward towards himself and outward towards his woman victims. He confesses in the courtroom that he killed Jane Morris and that he killed her intentionally, as if he wants to die in the North. But they sentence him to imprisonment of seven years. The distant call still rings in his ears. It's futile to deceive oneself. That distant call still rings in my ears. I thought that my life and marriage here would silence it. As for Jane Morris, he marries her after pursuing her for three years. He knows that she's a woman who abstains from nothing, cheating, lying, or stealing. He knows that she is being unfaithful to him and often asks himself what it was that bound him to her. The natural reaction is for him to leave her. Instead, he obeys the pleasure principle and decides to stay with her, completely controlled by his id, given in to his desires. His love to her is the icy battlefield from which he would not make a safe return. He is the sailor, and she is the shore of destruction. He says, I was in torment, and in a way I could not understand, I derived pleasure from my suffering. The second level is the South-North dichotomy. Mustafa Said's relationship with the West is one of defiance and yearning. There are many times in the novel where Mustafa Said says that he is south that yearns for the north and for the ice. It is the same north that he is waging war against. His apartment in London is full of Persian rugs with the smell of incense and Eastern perfumes. The narrator, visiting the secret room of Mustafa Said in the village in the Sudan, describes it as a graveyard, a huge joke. It is packed with English books and not a single Arabic book. It has a fireplace in the middle and two Victorian chairs. The room resembles an English apartment, uh, while his apartment in London has the oriental grandeur and lustful odors of the Orient. His love to Jane Morris unfolds the same dichotomy, love, defiance, and hatred. After putting the blade edge between her breasts, he confesses his love to her. It was the night of truth and the night of tragedy. 
The third level is that of Mustafa Saeed as both the conqueror and the conquered. I have come to you as a conqueror. Are his words every time a new victim falls for him? The narrator describes it as a melodramatic phrase. Unable to forget that he is at the same time the Arab African, he tells Isabella Seymour that I seek not glory, for the likes of me do not seek glory. The two halves of Mustafa represent the Sudanese traditional man and the modern London intellectual, the economist and university lecturer. Nowhere does he emerge uh, in the novel as fully traditional or fully modern. He is not a truly modern individual, nor a genuinely traditional one because of the impact of both forces, his past identity and Western education. In the secret room, the narrator finds an unwritten biography of Mustafa with only one line dedication. Opening a notebook, I read on the first page, my life story. On the next page was the dedication to those who see with one eye speak with one tongue, and see things as either black or white, either Eastern or Western. The dedication limits any possibility of encounter between the East and the West. One interpretation is that his life story is dedicated, perhaps, to those who see the coming of the British as a blessing, a civilizing mission. Richard, an English economist affirms that the Arabs cannot manage to live without the British and that their presence, that is the British, is indispensable. The narrator speaks of the railways, ships, hospitals, factories, and schools that will be ours soon. What Mustafa establishes is a very different view. The ships sailing down the Nile were carrying guns, not bread. And the railways were set up to transport troops. And the schools started to teach the Sudanese how to say yes in English. Uh, remember the cultural domination in Edward Said's Orientalism? It could as well be read as a dedication to a being who sees things as entirely Western or entirely uh, Eastern who is not both traditional and modern, someone without a divided self. And now I will discuss the contradictory selves of Mustafa Said. Mustafa lives and becomes a lie. He is Hassan, Charles, Amin, Mustafa, and Richard. When Isabella Seymour asks him about his race, he answers, I'm like Othello, Arab African. Then when he addresses the jury and prosecutors in the courtroom, he says, I am no Othello, I am a lie. Why don't you sentence me to be hanged and so kill the lie? So who is Othello? Who knows who's Othello? Okay, hey, hi guys uh, and girls. And girls. Uh, I'm gonna talk a bit about uh, Othello. Uh, he's uh, one of Shakespeare's many uh, tragic heroes, if not one of his most tragic heroes. Uh, Othello, like uh, Mustafa Saeed, is an Arab African man and he's often referred to as a Berber by many of the white European characters in the, in the novel. Uh, but even though he's a black man, uh, he, ha he holds a high respectable position in the Venetian army or military, and that's because he's very a very skilled soldier, and uh, so this gain gained him respect uh, in the army. And his skills were also useful in winning the heart of a high respectable and wealthy uh, Venetian woman, but this did not sit well with his... Uh, 
uh, white colleagues or underlings because they couldn't accept the fact that a Berber man, thick lips, a Moor, could be with a white woman and they couldn't. And so they tried to plot his downfall and they uh, devised many uh, twisted schemes uh, to do that and eventually they succeeded and um, he fell for his irrational desires and as Dr. Mench uh, Dr. Aida mentioned, his uh, Thanatos took over and he eventually led to his own self-destruction and so his tragic story ended like that. Thank you. Okay, Othello, as you all know, is the Moor of Venice. He's a tragic man, a hero with a flow. And it seems that uh, at the end of Othello, he smothers the face of his wife, Desdemona, the beautiful Desdemona, and kills her. After killing her, he says the following. Speak of me as I am, then must you speak of one that loved not wisely, but too well. Okay. At the end of the novel, we find the nat narrator trapped halfway in the river between South, the Sudan, and North, England. And for the first time in his life, he takes a decision. The decision to stay in his country in the Sudan. He says, all my life I had not chosen, had not decided. Now I am making a decision. I choose life. And like a comic actor shouting on stage, I screamed with all my remaining strength, help, help. Now, uh, it's up to you to decide if it's a pessimistic ending or an optimistic one, or maybe both at the same time. As for Mustafa Saeed, if his intellect and knowledge were used to develop the South, his struggle to avenge the Sudanese would have led him to the Sudan and not to Victoria Station and to tragedy. He loved too well, but not wisely. Thank you. Good luck in your final exams.